Well, this evening, it's Arjuna and Plato's Philosopher King. And as I decided to explore this, I wasn't sure whether or not this is, abs this is the fairest comparison we could make for just in terms of style. The Gita is very aphoristic. The sentences are not developed, and the connections between successive sentences tend to stand on themselves, or they're in clusters, and the connection between these clusters is not developed. So it's a different style of writing, therefore the Gita is aphoristic, and the Platonic, therefore, the Republic, is very systematic, carefully detailed, a lot of interrelationships between the two. But apart from style, there's another kind of problem which I'd like to introduce you to, but we'll get there slowly, I think. As everybody, I think, recognizes the story of the Gita, basically, it's the story of Prince Arjuna, who's a member of the Pandavas, and the eldest brother of the family, Duryodhana, decided to see whether he could command all of the wealth and the power and the lands of his father, the king, who was blind. And therefore, there was a schism and a split between Duryodhana and Prince Arjuna, led to a clash. And Krishna plays a major role. Now, Krishna is the personification of Vishnu, a god. Therefore, one of the questions for the Mahabharata, of which the Gita is only part, the Gita is only 18 chapters of a very vast work called the Mahabharata, the great Maha, the great Bharata. So one of the issues in the Mahabharata is how did Krishna how did Arjuna end up with Krishna as his charioteer and companion? Well, Krishna offered to both of the brothers when they decided they could have nothing, no way of reconciling their differences and therefore they were going to war. Krishna offered his Vrishnas, which are 10,000 of the greatest fighters and the most carefully and well-armed troops and trained. Or uh, he could just be present with one or the other. So, of course, Duryodhana chose the 10,000 warriors, and Prince Arjuna said, well, I'd rather just have you along with me. And so doesn't realize that Vishnu, of course, that Krishna is the personification of a god, but he discovers later. So all of the people involved have to choose sides and, and therefore friends and family members, teachers divide and it's a civil war, which of course are the worst kinds of wars. The night before the battle, Prince Arjuna takes his chariot and drives between the two forces and he has this talk, dialogue with Krishna, and he's wondering, what am I here for? Why do I really want to do this? Because Prince Arjuna is part of the Kshatriyas, which is a warrior caste. Now, if he makes him a warrior caste in line with the king, therefore, in the, the royal lineage, he is a warrior guardian And Plato's philosopher king comes out of the guardian class to rule, and therefore he too has experience and a skilled warrior. So in that sense, they are quite equal. All right, Prince Arjuna, therefore, is a possible in the lineage for being king and the warrior guardians out of which the philosopher king emerges, of course, 
takes over the state as well. So here it's a possible kingdom, possible kingdom. So in that respect, they're quite similar. Now, since a kshatriya warrior class is a caste, there is an option they always have. They can reject their class or the, see, they're members of the caste system. They can reject the caste and become a renunciate, a mystic, and live in the forest, usually, all right, among others, a renunciate, sometimes living without clothes, and therefore that's a legitimate option for someone who rejects their caste. So Arjuna is talking to Krishna, he says, you know, maybe the spiritual life of a renunciate is far superior to warrior. And Krishna has to persuade Arjuna to stay. Because as he says, there's nothing more important than fulfilling your duty or, and your membership in a caste. The dialogue, therefore, that takes place in the Gita is made up of some 18 chapters. And each of the chapters, of course, deals with certain very interesting subjects. I have outlined a good number of them here because the chapters themselves are particular ways or yogas. So the work itself is a system of yogas. The way of, of ultimate reality is the second. I didn't make this large enough, okay. It's the second chapter. The way of action, sometimes called karma yoga. Right. It's the third chapter. The way of knowledge, which is a, a jnana yoga, which is the fourth chapter. Renunciation is the fifth way of renunciation. Meditation is a very famous sixth one. Realization seven, which I wrote very small here for some reason. Uh, the way to Brahma. Now Brahma is the nature of ultimate reality. That's the highest term. Now, each one is a different yoga. Way of wisdom, love, the supreme self, and the liberation through renunciation. Now, um, I am particularly interested in looking at the supreme self and the way to ultimate reality, since these are, as these others are equally important in Plato's Republic. So I brought along a copy of the Gita, and I thought I'd read you some quotes, raise an issue. And when I get a chance to get into Plato's Republic, I'm going to pull out about 10 very short quotes in order to carry a parallel. So now, I just picked up this copy in the bookstore downstairs. And uh, ultimate reality. is chapter eight. See whether you can keep in mind some of the key ideas I'm going to just pull out of here. Brahma is that which is immutable, independent of any cause but itself. When we consider Brahma as lodged within the individual being, then we call it the Atman. The creative energy of Brahman is that which is, causes all existence to come into being. All right? It's the cause of all existences to come into being. Well, there we have it. It's the creative energy, which is the cause of all that comes into being. Now, I want a couple of more. 
Now, remember me at all times, says Krishna to Arjuna. Do your duty. If your mind and heart are not set upon me constantly, right, then if your mind and heart are set upon me constantly, you'll come to me. Don't doubt it. Make a habit of practicing meditation. Don't let your mind get distracted. Now, he is the all-knowing God. All-knowing. All right, he's the all-knowing. And this is rather important, you see. He's the all-knowing God, universal sustainer, shining, sun-like, self-luminous. Right? And that's, of course, shining sunlight, right? and of course, therefore, self-luminous. And the sustainer, again, see, the cause of all existence coming into being, also the sustainer. And I wanted to make sure I could read that to you. Right. This is a stainer. Okay, one more. Um. And he who knows Brahman, who takes this path, goes to Brahman, he doesn't return, no reincarnation. The yoga who takes this path will reach the lunar light. Light. Right. So, that's what I just want to take out as the key ideas on chapter 8. And I'd like to say a few words about the Supreme Self that they now... The Supreme Self is another word for Brahman. So it's the same, same idea, Supreme Self is the idea of Brahman. And um, I have a couple of quotes here. It's so strange to read a different book when I'm used to another one. I just borrow this. Let him take refuge in that primal being from whom all this seeming activity streams forth forever. It's a primal being. This is my infinite being. Supreme Self, therefore, is an infinite being. It shines self-luminous always. And he who attains me never be reborn. Part of myself is the God within every creature. The sages see him with the eye of wisdom. Now, again, the theme of light in one whole stanza. The life, the, pardon me, the light <clears throat> that lives in the sun, lighting all the world, the light of the moon, the light that is in fire, know that light is to be mine. My energy enters the earth, sustains all that lives.
He who realizes this truly wise. The purpose of his life is fulfilled. So, there is a similarity, therefore, as it should be, between the idea of Brahman as ultimate reality and the Supreme Self. Now, the way, see, this, if this is a yoga, it is essentially saying in many ways the same thing, which is to fix your mind on that. Now, it's different with karma yoga or action yoga because that deals with action, how to sustain action without accruing any additional, uh, as they call it, uh, negative karma. Not that you don't pick up good. But, uh, and that's to act in such a way that you are indifferent to both pleasure and pain, victory, defeat, you have to therefore stay in an even-mindedness through all activity and doing that is karma yoga. Now, what's important in this, um, I want to see whether I can highlight by saying a few things about their view of knowledge and then I'll leave the Gita and do something else, okay? So, way of knowledge. Oh. He knows bliss and the Atman. Wants nothing else. He renounces craving. He's illumined. Free from fear, free, free from anger, free from things of desire. I call him a seer, illumined. The bonds of his flesh are broken. He's lucky, doesn't rejoice. The tortoise can draw in its legs. The seer can draw in his senses. I call him illumined. Now, I want to read this because it, in some way, it might be described as a method. Thinking about sense objects will attach you to sense objects. Grow attached, you become addicted. Thwart your addiction, it turns to anger. Be angry, and you confuse your mind. Confuse your mind, you forget the lesson of experience. Forget experience, you lose discrimination. Lose discrimination, and you miss life's only purpose. Well, then how can we meditate? When a man can still the senses, I call him illumined. illumined. The recollected mind is awake. In the knowledge of the Atman, which is a dark night to the ignorant, the ignorant awake in their sense life, which they think is daylight. To the seer, it's all darkness. The water flows continually into the ocean, but the ocean's never disturbed. Desire flows into the mind of the seer, but he's never disturbed. The seer knows peace. The man who stirs up his own lust can never know peace. He who knows peace who has forgotten desire. He lives without craving. That's the state of enlightenment in Brahman. Now, in what way is that a yoga? And it's, they're admonitions, they're things that they're telling you to do, to reach something they're calling knowledge. All right, now what is that? That's an really very heavily an ethical very have an ethical view. That's the preparation for knowledge. And the example they use is really a fine example. It's often been commented on. 
because the tortoise, the tortoise has six limbs. And in the Veda, so do we. The five senses plus the intellect. They call the intellect another way of apprehending. And therefore, as the tortoise can pull back all of its limbs, so the sage is said to be able to withdraw consciousness from each of those and become self-absorbed. That's the way of knowledge. So it's a meditative discipline, heavily ethical. Now, see if we can shift gears for a moment. Um, let's talk about these issues now. Finally, Arjuna is told, told all of this, and he appreciates what he's hearing, but he's got a problem. His problem is the battle is the next morning. And it's likely that to learn this is going to take a little time. What he needs, therefore, is some quick insight. <laughs> and so he says, look here, Krishna, you know what I need? I need, to, I need to recognize you as the divine. I need to recognize divinity. And so Krishna says, okay, I'll give you the eye of yoga, a gift. It's nothing, right? It's a gift. And with that eye, with that eye of yoga, you will now see the divine manifestation. Now, when you see the divine manifestation, that's called Ishvara. Now, we're going to move from that to this. Actually, what's nice about the book, it's actually reversed. So, when I made those notes precedingly, the way, the way, the way, the way, I left out a couple of chapters. And the reason I did it is because I wanted to focus on them now. So, is different from Brahma? Prabhupada? From, uh, Krishna? No, excuse me. Said, Krishna. Louder? Vishnu. Is Vara is different from Vishnu? Oh, you'll see that. Okay. So Arjuna in the 11th chapter begins, By your grace you have taught me the truth about the Atman, the divine in man and the divine in all things. Your words are mystic and sublime. They've dispelled my ignorance. From you, whose eyes are like the lotus flowers, I have learnt in detail of the origin and the dissolution of creatures and of your own infinite glory. O Supreme Lord, you are as you describe yourself to be. I, I don't doubt that. Nevertheless, I long to behold your divine form. If you find me worthy of that vision, reveal it to me. So Krishna says, hey, you know, there are a lot of people who want a lot of things. and You've certainly picked out a pretty important thing. But you're not going to be able to see me with human eyes. Therefore, he says, I give you divine sight. Behold, this is my yoga power. Now, this is the unfolding of a vision. When he had spoken these words, Sri Krishna, master of all the yogis, revealed to Arjuna his transcendent divine form. 
speaking from innumerable mouths, seeing with a myriad eyes of many marvelous aspects, adorned with countless divine ornaments, brandishing all kinds of heavenly wealth weapons, wearing celestial garlands and the raiment of paradise, anointed with perfumes of heavenly fragrance, full of revelations, resplendent, boundless, of ubiquitous regard. Now, one, suppose a thousand suns should rise together into the sky. Such is the glory of the shape of infinite God. Then the son of Pandu beheld the entire universe and all its multi, multi, multitudinous diversity lodged as one being within the body of the God of Gods. Then was Arjuna, that lord of mighty richness, overcome with wonder. His hair stood erect. He bowed low before God in adoration, clasped his hands and spoke, Oh, my God, I see the, all the gods within your body. Each in, 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 this, in his degree, a multitude of creatures. See, Lord Brahma, throned upon the lotus. See all the sages, all the holy serpents. Universal form, I see you without limit. Infinite arms, eyes, mouths, bellies, see, and finally no end. Mist or beginning. So, at this point, two things. All right. The light is spoken of as a thousand suns. All right. Like a thousand suns. And then there's going to be a progressive unfoldment of this vision. And what he sees, therefore, is a God within all gods, a God that, in fact, subsumes within himself all gods. So we have a a God that within are all gods, and then within all gods are each of their domains, all of the ways in which they relate, all the resplendent qualities. So you're going further into it as the, de as the description unfolds. You're kind of brought into it. And at the same time, you're getting a description of what it's like for Arjuna to experience it. So as this unfolds, at first it's rather startling to him. Right. Overcome with wonder, his hair stood erect. Okay. Then it unfolds further. You are all we know, supreme beyond man's measure, the world's sure set pilth, refuge never shaken. Million-armed, the sun and the moon, your eyeballs, fiery-faced, you blast the world to ashes. You fill the sky's four corners, span the chasm, sundering heaven and earth. Supreme and awful is your form. It's awful. So as this vision unfolds, it has a greater and greater effect upon him. At, at the sight of this, your shape is stupendous, full of mouths, eyes, feet, thighs, bellies, terrible with fangs. O oh, mighty master, all the worlds are fear struck, even as I am. I fear struck, even as I am. When I see you, Vishnu, that's what he says, that's Vishnu, you see, omnipresent, shouldering the sky in use of rainbow, with your mouths agape and flame eyes staring, all my peace is gone, my heart is troubled. Now with frightful tusks, your mouths are gnashing, 
flaring like the fires of doomsday morning, north, south, east, west, all seem confounded. Lord of the David's world's abode, have mercy. Are you having mercy? Have mercy. I'm going to skip because it goes further, but swift as many rivers streaming into the ocean, rush the heroes of your fiery gullets. Moth-like to meet the flame of their own destruction, headlong they plunge into you and perish. Licking with your burning tongues, devouring all the worlds, you probe the heights of heaven with intolerable beams, O Vishnu. Tell me who you are, and from the beginning, you of that aspect, grim, O God of gods, be gracious. Take my homage. Lord, take me your ways. Right? From me, your ways are hidden. Krishna then says, I come as time. The waster of peoples. So what does he say? He says, you know what? what I'll tell you what I am. He said, if you could have a vision of the beginning and end of all that is in a brief period of time, you would then see galaxies coming into existence and passing out of existence. You'd see civilizations, nations, people, cats, dogs, all beings coming and being devoured by time. You'd see this as time. The unfoldment of time in its entirety as a vision, seeing it all collapsed into a short period of time, that's Vishnu. Oh, pardon me, that's sometimes called Ishvara or Vishnu. Now, this is very important, you see, because this is the unfolding, this is the unfolding of time. Now, there are two aspects of time in philosophy, and let me quickly make a point about it. The unfolding of time in a brief period is a vast vision, overwhelming, because you're seeing creation and destruction all within a brief period of time. But to see that simultaneous, right, if you can see all time now, not unfolding, then it's in the palm of your hand, right? That's simultaneous. So eternity, eternity is time in respect to its simultaneous totality. This is a different kind of experience, therefore, than this. Now, Finally, Arjuna says, hey, look, I've seen enough. Please turn it off. And so uh, Krishna turns it off. He says, okay. He says, please go back to that form that I'm used to. And he says, okay. And this, therefore, is seen with the eye of yoga. Now, now we step into a different kind of world. And Nicola Landa's translation um, and several other Hindu scholars date the Gita at 500 BC, which is roughly the same date as Socrates. European scholars who are into the game of history want to date it to, two, to 200 BC. And between these, these are the extremes in the dating game. So in any case, it's very clear that we're dealing with a par some kind of parallel between the two in terms of time. Now, um, when we get into the Republic and Plato's, Plato's Republic, 
it becomes important to ask what is the ideal state for both man and the city state. <clears throat> because there are many features between them that are the same. Now, the ideal state of man and for the city state, I want to change something. The ideal state for man and the city state, as most perfectly presented, Therefore, ideally, becomes a subject for Plato's Republic. He asks, what kinds of natures would most ideally, with the least kind of change, become candidates for the philosopher king? With the least change, it's, rather, it's, easy, it's easy to understand that. Uh, the way in which man can become most easily ideal is to become a philosopher. That's all. Well, that doesn't tell us too much because that means now you have to describe what this strange kind of thing is called the philosopher and describe his true nature. And so that's in fact becomes the subject of a, a great exploration. <clears throat> so Plato says, well, I'll, I'll tell you what you need to do. If there is someone who's going to be a candidate for this philosopher king, you just see a couple of things. Primarily, though, you have to see whether or not they have the ability to hold on to wisdom. That's a very important thing. Right, you have to be able to hold on to it. Not just encounter it, hold on to it. Well, where's the difficulty in holding on to it? Well, and what does he mean by it? He says, oh, I'll tell you what I mean by it. I mean by it, that which always is. Unchanging. It's unchanging. Oh, by the way, that's the same as this word. Right? Being, that's another word for being. Huh. But there's a, a curious way in which we can make it even closer. He calls it also beauty itself. Those are the two marks. Beauty itself, that thing which is always unchanging, those are the kinds of things he means when he talks about wisdom. Well, what is it like to encounter it? What is the experience of this? What is the experience? What would it be like if you described it? Right. So, we need that. Well, he's got a very nice way of describing it. He says, you know, This unchanging, always unchanging beauty itself, another word for it, is being, with a capital B. Now, anything that comes into existence and passes out of existence, right, everything made, manufactured, anything at all that grows, that is nurtured, all of that, that comes into being. But that's another word. It's the same word, but it means that which is generated, that's created, that's made. Therefore, it's a small b. Because it doesn't stick around. It's not always unchanging. It not always is. Therefore, the Greeks always make a big difference between capital B and lowercase b. And in philosophy, we make that difference when we say uh, 
being and call this one existence. Now, if you talk about being with a capital B, it has a curious property, and that is that there's something about the very nature of reality that it can turn upon itself. This is actually a metaphor, but we're going to use it uh, as if it were a process. Okay, it can turn upon itself. When it turns upon itself, what does it encounter? It encounters beauty itself, as experienced as light. Therefore, it is said in Plato, that is a very brilliant light that shines in the soul of man, and here, of course, you see a beautiful picture of the soul. And here's man. Therefore, Plato says, you know what you need to do to create this just man or the just state is to find someone who can direct, right, can hold on to this experience. Because if they can hold on to it, then they can make a comparison. They can then, by constantly reflecting on that, they can then decide very clearly what's beautiful and what's good. <clears throat> and on the basis of that, they can then set down laws and ordinances both for the state and themselves. That's the basic, that's the basic um, approach into Plato's Republic, and it's described in Book Six, on the early part of Book Six. Now, what does that mean? The, there's another way of talking about this uh, bright, shining pattern in the soul. He calls being, capital B, he says it's the most brilliant light of being. Huh? And that, that's the goal of the training and the education of the philosopher king. Now, oh, look here. In Plato and in the Gita, that's the cause of all existence that comes into being, and it's the sustainer, and it's shining sunlight, and it's self-luminous. It's the same thing, very clearly. And luckily enough, I got a hunk of Plato here. I can get a quote quickly. And, uh, This is a quote, a favorite quote in the Republic, Book 7. It's like one of the uh, conclusions to Plato's Allegory of the Cave. He says, this is at uh, 517b. He says, at least what appears to me is that the world of the known, the last of all, is the idea of the good. And with what toil to be seen. And seen, this must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all, which gives birth to light and the king of light and the world of sight and in the world of mind, herself the queen, produces truth and reason. She must be seen by one who is to act with reason publicly and privately. What does that mean? It means, therefore, that we can talk about the relationship between this, which is the same as in Plato. It's functioning in the same way, it functions in the same way. 
there's a difference. There's a difference. Because from this point on in Plato's Republic, what he wants to do, by careful reasoning, by careful reasoning, by very careful reasoning, use of metaphors, similes, analogies, allegories, divided line, parables, uh, not parables in that sense. What he wants to show is two things. He, by very careful reason and involvement on many levels, he wants to show how we must develop the understanding to appreciate the fact that this experience, which goes by another name too, he collapses this, and he calls it the idea of the good. Because the word idea means to behold, the idea of the good, to behold the good. His whole goal, therefore, from this point on, is to try to bring us through understanding, first to see the need for experiencing it, Therefore, it's a very interesting kind of yoga, intellectual yoga, where you're required to see how all of the pieces fit together into a massive and brilliantly executed work that shows you, that shows the need to move from the idea of the good to the good itself. So therefore, at this point, the whole republic changes. And now he's going to say, look here. You have to see how you can bring yourself to this experience of wisdom, this changing, the unchanging reality, beauty itself. And you have to see by understanding the process that once you gain this vision, this experience, you then have to use the understanding to see that there's something higher than that as the cause of that. And the cause of that is the good itself. Now, how does he do it? He builds a different kind of yoga than the one we mentioned. He says, you know what we need? We need a different way of understand, different way of understanding arithmetic, different way of understanding arithmetic, not the kind that's normally taught. Arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, that's what we need. Astronomy, harmony. We have to take all of those in a higher way, in a much more higher way. We have to then see the kinship between all of them. We have to see their kinship and community. If we don't do that, we're not going to get anywhere. If you can see the kinship and community between these studies, then that's the beginning step that will take you from here to here. That's the feature of the dialectic. Plato's dialectic only begins here. So all of the training of the philosopher king that brought him to this vision, he now has to develop his mind through understanding and the use of the dialectic to see that this is not ultimate, can't be ultimate, but there is something beyond it in both dignity and in power. So let me give you, a, remember I said I got a couple of quotes for you. Well, It's a curious quote, and it'll make all of the points I was just making in a much better way. When it returns, understand then, 
that it is the same with the soul. Thus, when it settles itself firmly in that region in which truth and real being brightly shine, right, brightly shine, a real being brightly shines, it understands, <clears throat> it understands and knows it and appears to have reason. But when it has nothing to rest on but that which is mingled with darkness, that which becomes and perishes, then it opines, it grows dim-sighted, changing opinions up and down, and is like something without reason. Then that which provides their truth to the things known, that which provides their truth to the things known, this is what can be known, so this is the highest object of knowledge, that which provides their truth to the things known and gives the power of knowing to the knower, that's the principle of the good. It's the cause of understanding of truth as far as known. And while knowledge and truth as we know them are both beautiful, right, sure is beautiful, right, sure is beautiful, you will be right in thinking that it's something different Something still more beautiful than these, as for knowledge and truth, just as we said before that it was right to consider light and the sight to be sun-like, but wrong to think of them to be the sun, so here it's right to consider both these to be good-like, but wrong to think them to be the good. The eternal nature of the good must be allowed a much higher value. shift. The sun, <clears throat> now here's the analogy for this, the sun provides not only the power of being seen for things seen, but as I think you will agree, also their generation, their growth, and their nurture, although it is not itself generation. Similarly with things known, you will agree that the good is not only the cause of their becoming known, but it's the cause that knowledge exists and the state of knowledge it's the cause that knowledge exists and the state of knowledge. Although the good is not a state of knowledge, but something transcending it far beyond in both dignity and power. So therefore the thing is, how do you go from it? Therefore there's something far beyond this and all of its beauty and bliss. That's the good. It's beyond knowing, transcends knowledge, transcends all those. That's the good. That's what Plato brings in to us. That is profound as the Gita is, and it's a favorite of mine in many ways. Plato wants to go beyond this. And in going beyond it, he uses the intellect. And the intellect, therefore, Plato, is something analogous to the yoga, the eye of the soul. So then the dialectic must proceed from here to do just one thing. And it's the most curious of all things, you see. Here. Would you not agree, as totally obvious, that if somebody is in this, experiencing this as part and parcel of themselves and the very nature of ultimate reality, that it's likely, it is likely, I think you will all agree, that this person may enjoy it. Ecstatically. <laughs> right? Now, how do you get this dude to see that where he's at is magnificent and all of that, but there's something beyond it. That's why you have to develop understanding and begin to trust understanding because this dialectic is going to criticize this, whether you like it or not. And in criticizing it, it's going to leave open something higher and something that transcends it. That's the role of the intellect and the understanding. 
So therefore, it takes this. It take, what does it do? It tries to first educate us, to, to bring us to this, and then says, okay, now you have to do the work. Well, in the end of the Gita, and in the end of the Republic, there's something similar. The war is over in the Gita. Terrible destruction, 18 days of terrible destruction. And the uh, leaders of the battle, the, the victors, some go off into renunciation. After all, they've killed many people who are their friends and relatives and everything else, and so they take off to renunciate. In Plato's Republic, the end of the philosopher king's duties, as it were, And when they are 50 years old, those who have come safely through and distinguished themselves everywhere in everything, both action and knowledge, must now be brought to the last task. They must be made to uplift the brilliant radiance of the soul and fix their gaze on that which provides life for all. That's the vision. Now, why do we say there's something beyond it? They must be made to uplift the brilliant radiance of the soul and to fix their gaze on that which provides life for all. Then, beholding the good in itself and using that as a standard, they must adorn city and men, yes, themselves also for the rest of their lives, each in turn, most of the time spent in philosophy. But when their turn comes, they must labor hard yet again in politics. Rulers they must each be for the city's sake, and doing it not as a beautiful thing, but as a necessity. And so educating others to be like them, they must leave them as guardians of the city in their place, then depart and dwell in the islands of the blessed. The city shall make public monuments and sacrifices in their honor, as holy spirits of the Pythian oracle concurs, or else as men happy and divine. Right? So, so it's, this is uh, kind of quite interesting. The great effort for this kind of meditative game goes on in stages, but clearly at 50, right, there is the yoga, for this particular game, and then a return, and then going back. And through it, through it, the whole purpose is to do this, but in doing this, this person becomes just and lays the foundation for a just city or a model for justice, and therefore it then become part of the culture. And therefore, it's quite an interesting thesis that Plato presents to us. Now, oh, I got one or two more quotes I want to read to you because I thought they were pretty good when I reflected on this a short while ago. And um, Ah, oh yeah, better watch when I do this because sometimes I get into reading. Um. The need for this vision, all right? The need for this training. If it is unknown in what way just things and beautiful things are good, these things will not have gained a guardian of themselves worth much, and one who does not know this himself, and I prophesize that no one will understand them satisfactorily before he does. If it is unknown 
in what way just and beautiful things are good, see? That's this connection. Right? That's this connection. You have to see in what way this is beautiful. This is just. You have to know in what way this just and beautiful thing is good. And if you don't know that, he's saying, then you're not going to be able to use what it is you experienced and everything that you've worked so hard for. If it's unknown in what way just things and beautiful things are good, these things will not have gained a guardian of themselves worth much. So he says, you know what we have to do? We have to build a model. We have to build a model See, the curiosity now, watch the way he's going to use this language. He's going to say that the relationship between these two is that this, in fact, can be said to be an offspring of the good. You have to see that this is the offspring of this. Now, surely now my, my meaning must appear to be that this, the offspring of the good, which the good begat, is in relation to the good itself an analogy. And what the good affects by its influence in the region of mind, towards mind and towards things thought, this the sun affects in the region of seeing, towards sight and things seen. My meaning must appear to be that this, the offspring of the good, which the good begat, is in relationship to the good itself an analogy. And what the good affects by its influence in the region of mind towards things thought, the, this the sun affects in the region of sight towards sight and things seen. See? Therefore, he leaving us with this analogy. That becomes the model of the idea of the good. That's a model. So now the rest of the Republic is nothing else but trying to make sense and to work out that analogy. That's what he's doing. Now if you can see the analogy, then you understand it. If you understand it, then you see the need to see that there's a relationship between here, and you shouldn't call this the paramount term. You should rather see it in relationship to this. Now, in terms of regal thought, he now spins a great line, which we read before, and he calls this the queen. And he calls this the king. So he says, this is a regal couple, the ultimate couple, the highest expression. And therefore, the king is to the queen, he has an amine analogy, like the queen is to the sun. Therefore, he has a mean analogy. The significance of that he spends a good number of pages on, which if we can then keep and maintain, it'll keep us from thinking that this is the end. For you have two tasks after this. One, to know that it's different than the good and the relationship between the two. Now going back, remember when I said I'm not sure whether this is a fair comparison to make with the Gita? Because, um, Shankaracharya goes further than the Gita, but um, I did want to make some of these points, and uh, even though it may not be equivalent on all points, I did want to make the comparisons because of the things that I mentioned a short while ago, which seem to be similar. So, thank you.
can you can you repeat that last point about Shankaracharya and He goes further. Shankaracharya goes further than the Gita. And that's another story. But Shankaracharya goes uh, in, into what is equivalent in Buddhist thought to, to uh, Shunya. There are very many similarities depending on what understanding you have of Shunyata and the good. Because okay, you, you the good is to. What? Pardon me? You can either have the bliss is Shunya or something beyond the bliss as the void. Depending upon the understanding. I, I, I don't know what, I'm, I'm not sure. Change it, okay? In this game, okay, for a moment, the overwhelming beauty is what produces the bliss. They're intimately connected, right? And when you have an overwhelming experience of beauty, I think you're sure that there's something there that's beautiful. Is that fair to conclude? Therefore, being. So if something goes beyond beauty, then it goes outside of this kind of language where you talk about this as a bliss. Now, if your point is, is there some kind of bliss over here, it ain't the same, right? But it, it certainly appears to be worthwhile. Well, actually, I was just wondering about the different understandings of the word shunyata. Oh, there are a whole bunch of them. There's a whole, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are all kinds of different views of shunyata. One is just simply uh, um, the denial of the self, the denial of a person, the denial of anything permanent in anything is a denial of being. Now, that goes two ways depending upon what Buddhist you're talking to. Um, does that mean the denial of a personal, a personal entity within us or within things? That's one level. Another Buddhist would say, yeah, that's true, but you gotta go further than that. There is in fact, nothing you can say is there. That is to say, it is, it is an emptiness, but it's not dead. It's not mere nothingness. There's a vitality to it. And therefore, it's not empty in that sense of nothingness. But you can't detect in it any being, person, thing, ego, soul. So there are various ways. I think there are 29 different ways. But that's another story. Maybe we do it sometime. But, uh, but, right? Okay. Or I can get you the book and you can read them. Probably be a lot easier. Yeah. The use of the dialectic, mm -hmm. you were talking about dialectic and understanding together. Yeah. So now in this bliss experience as, a, as a, an experience of knowledge, And do you have to leave that to look at it dialectically? No. Well, you can't stay too long in those. Some people can stay in amazing periods of time, but you still have to come out and get a cup of coffee. Right? I mean, you don't want to give that up. Absolutely. Cappuccino or something. No, it's so overwhelming, there's no, there's no sense of otherness. That's uh, Argojuna's like, being terrified. Now that's another, that's a different experience. That's a different experience. That's okay. under the aspect of time. And this, this is eternity. This is that first experience, like a thousand suns suddenly bursting into the heavens. He's trying to say something about shining sunlight that's different than seeing the unfoldment of time and all of its aspects. Right. So there are two states in chapter 11. But to look at this state. This one. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. a thousand suns, let's say. It's not the vision of time. Right. Uh, the eternity, if, if we were to say time, the uh, complete encapsulated. Yeah, okay. Don't use the word eternity for that. Use the idea of all encompassing time because it unfolds. Eternity is when the whole thing is a simultaneous now. And that wouldn't be? No, this, this unfolded in time, seeing time unfold. Many worlds are, create, are created and... That's the idea of the good? What is? The idea of the good, uh, when I'm referring to that right there, I'm referring to the idea of the good. But would that be equatable to eternity versus Argojunas? Okay, so I wasn't missing. Can you use the metaphor that in the creation of the universe, uh, God had to focus on um, himself, that became a model for the creation of the universe. Can you use that language for a moment? Well, that's sometimes called the idea in the mind of God. And creation is nothing other than the working out of that idea in time. So that creation is nothing other than the working out of all the implications of that one idea in the mind of God. Now, that one idea in the mind of God <clears throat> is just one idea. Just one idea. And it's a simultaneous idea. All of it's there. Bang in its totality, one idea. So that time, as they call it now, and the time is, time is the moving image of eternity. See? Time is a moving image of eternity. This is, this is eternity. <clears throat> a simultaneous, the simultaneity of that idea in the mind of God as one. It unfolds in time. Therefore, time itself is the moving image of eternity. Like, would you agree, <clears throat> let's see if I can use a, an example from mathematics. You've studied mathematics? Is it possible that there may be someone who knows more than anyone else about mathematics? Sure. Good. Could that person then know it so well that it's obvious to him? He could just understand mathematically. Sure. Now he could express what he understands mathematically in various systems of mathematics. But for him, mathematics is just one idea. Agree? Which he then see would you not agree there's some people who know more than one language? Is it possible that there might be someone who knows more languages than anyone else? Yeah. Is it likely then that if someone talks to that person who knows all these languages in the language that they know, do they then take out a book to make sure what's being said, or do they know that just as fluidly as the mathematician would know all the different systems of mathematics? Oh, hey, logic, is that the same case with logic? all the different systems of logic, whatever they may be, someone might know them all so thoroughly that it's just like looking through a window. It's obvious. That's the way in which they see the world. Is that right? Could we put all sciences in the same thing? It, may there not be someone who, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Can we, can we hypothesize now what it would be like for all of that to come together as one idea, because you can put all mathematics and logic together, according to Whitehead and Russell. There may be some simple way to understand all languages symbolically. You can put all, let's assume all knowledge can fit together into a unity, unified field theory. All knowledge together, all language together. Oh, by the way, might it not be someone who does the same thing with history? Psychology? 
Might that all possibly be integrated into one idea? And the person who would have it would just normally just see obvious everything? Is that right? And then someone could come up to him and say, do you mind, uh, can you tell us how you see that in each of the things? And then he could then spell it out. Is that right? So therefore it might be possible that there's just one idea in the mind of God that's absolutely clear. A totality, altogether, now, eternity. That's the Greek notion of eternity, see? Okay? But to dialectically explore that, we cannot be engaged in it. This is need to drop out of knowing to to a, a lower level, like, a, like a, using a divide line. Would you be moving from... You don't drop out of knowing. Knowing is the way in which you see, right? What are you saying? Do you drop out of languages when you know languages? There, but like an exper like an experience of bliss. Yeah. We wouldn't, we wouldn't um, stay in that. I don't there's understand. That. Say it again, please. Um, there, and it, the experience of bliss has an end. Only because you can't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And so there'd be a movement from one state into another. That's true. For those, yeah, it's a heavy burden on the system. And it's you have to have, you have to be, you know, you have to be strong. You have to have a good psychoneurology. No, That's what yoga is for. After we've moved out, after that experience of bliss has ended, is mm -hmm. that when we would dialectically explore that experience? Yes. And where would that be equatable in the divided line? If we were to look at those... It's not on the divided line. Okay. The dialectic's not? Yeah, it would be above it. It's what you do with, so you have to go beyond it. That's where you go to the good. That's where you learn the dialectic. The last stage is learning the dialectic and the, and the learning. But isn't it almost it's similar to understanding? But is there a difference in, right. a, in, similar a, to in the state of mind? That yeah, it similar to understanding. Yes. With understanding, you don't need to have this experience. You could come to conclusions about this without... Uh, Having experienced it. Through reason alone. Yes, I think, I think so. The difference is you wouldn't know whether it's true. And then now having the experience and knowing, having the confirmation, then you proceed further dialectically down the road to, to first principle, or the one or the good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does, does dialectic function as a cognitive state? Does or it function as a causative? As a cognitive state. As a cognitive state. Uh, as a separate cognitive state? It produces, it, pro it, um, it produces, see, it, it's a production. Um, it's a, look here, see, it's a denial. Watch. See, it's a, it did need a, a talk on dialectic by itself. Um, now then understand that by the other part in the divided line. Well, I, I can go to the uh, allegory of the cave, it's better. Um, Then the dialectical, the dialectic method proceeds along by this way. 
demolishing the hypothesis as it goes back to the very beginning itself in order to find firm ground. The soul's eye, which is really buried deep in a sort of barbaric bog, it draws out quietly and leads upwards, having the arts, as we described, as handmaidens and helpers. These we have often termed sciences from habit, but we need another name, one clearer for opinion and dimmer than science. We, we've defined it somewhere already as understanding. So, so is dialectic outside understanding? Is the dialectic outside of understanding? Like no. Beyond it? Yes. It's a passageway from, you have to use understanding. It's a passageway from understanding. As you use the arts and the sciences, yes. So does it partake of the realm of understanding then? Yes, of course. Okay. It uses language, but the ideas it uses are these ideas, this is the, look, this is the vocabulary for the dialectic. It comes out of this experience. If a person doesn't have the experience, then they're using a language for which they have no experience. You can use a rational process of understanding, but these terms you're using are not in what Plato calls the realm of understanding. It uses the process of understanding. But because they haven't experienced it, you wouldn't call it understanding. Yes. 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 I can. That's the very point he's making in book six, which I can just quickly read for you. Um, Now then understand that by the other part of things thought, I mean, what the arguing process itself grasps by the power of dialectic, treating assumptions not as beginnings but as literally hypotheses, that is to say steps and springboards for assault from which it may push its way up to the region free of assumptions and reach the beginning of all, grasp it, clinging again and again to whatever clings to this and so may come down to a conclusion without the help of anything at all that belongs to the senses, but only leads, but only ideals themselves. And passing through ideals, it may end in ideals. So it's the arguing process right, that treats assumptions not as beginnings, but as literally hypotheses as it demolishes them as it goes. If one doesn't have the experience of this, then the statements one makes about them are all tentative. Well, in that experience, you could identify the ideals. Yes. And that's where you need to start. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>